Um, so before my presentation, I would actually like to just use the first moments here to congratulate Morten um, on winning Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, what a, a monumental achievement and um, what an incredible time to be at the Department of Chemistry. So um, congratulations again, Morten. I'll briefly introduce my own background here. Um, I have a, a Master of Science in Engineering Physics from uh, DTU. Then I did my um, PhD in Food Science and, and Technology um, at the Department of Food Science at uh, Copenhagen University. Then I did my first postdoc um, with uh, Peter Tulstrup uh, at KU Chemistry. And I did postdocs at um, uh, DTU Chemistry with uh, Kasper Kalita Kep and uh, Peter Fristrup. Then I returned to KU Chemistry and uh, did postdocs uh, in, the, in the Knud Jensen group again. Um, um, I also had collaborations in my first postdoc with Peter, uh, with, with Knud. So, um, and um, subsequently I did an assistant professorship in the uh, Knud Jensen group. Um, and uh, unfortunately, funding then ended, and I actually quit academia in April 21. Then I was a computational chemist at APSU um, for six months, working with uh, explainable AI, um, especially applied to multiomics and um, problems in, in the life sciences. Um, and then I uh, got funding for my own salary uh, from the uh, Willem Foundation. I got an experiment uh, grant, which uh, allowed my re-entry into KU Chemistry in uh, January this year as an assistant professor. Um, and I am uh, physically loca located in the Knud Jensen Group um, again, and, and also collaborating um, with uh, the Knud Jensen Group. Um, I should say that the OR arching uh, theme in my uh, my postdocs uh, and my, my PhD has been molecular modeling um, on, on various uh, biomolecular systems. Um, so this talk that I would call the application of molecular modeling to sex interpretation in nano bioinorganic chemistry. Um, the, the title is chosen because uh, actually there are applications in both nano, bioorganic, and, and inorganic chemistry. Um, so um, it is it is clear that uh, both SACS and molecular modeling are important methods in the study of bio uh, macromolecular structure. And um, SACS is, uh, can readily be calculated from atomic coordinates, which allow the combination of molecular modeling uh, and SACS. Uh, so there's a synergy to be achieved there. Um, and so this approach will then it's, uh, incorporate additional structural details compared to simpler models, such as beat models that are sometimes used in SAC studies. Um, so I will, uh, I will use this talk um, to review uh, some of uh, our applications of this uh, combined molecular modeling SACS approach um, in, uh, in various studies um, throughout um, the, the last uh, decade or so. Um, and uh, I will focus on peptide oligonucleotide conjugates. Uh, that, that study was done in the Bionex Center. Um, and I will also talk about DNA happen stabilized silver nanoclusters, uh, which was a collaboration with the Toolstop and Jaron groups. I will talk about uh, terpyridine modified human insulin, uh, which was done in the context of the biodelivery center. And I also promised in my abstract that I would talk about alpha um, but um, that pertains to my current project. And uh, since the results have uh, not been published yet, um, I will try to attenuate that aspect a little bit. Um. So why SACS? Um, SACS is uh, complementary to uh, techniques to crystallography and NMR and, and other techniques. Um, it allows the study of molecules in solution in, in potential uh, biomimetic environment, uh, also of molecules that do not crystallize. It studies scattering at uh, small angles. Um, that's typically 0.1 to 5 degrees. 
and this angle, the scattering an angle is uh, inversely related to the feature size. And it is inherently a nano method since uh, the feature sizes studied are from uh, one nanometer to 100 nanometers, typically. So here I will outline um, the, uh, a simple SACS experiment and a simple uh, SACS calculation. Um, so in a, in a SACS experiment, um, a highly collimated X-ray beam from a synchrotron or from another X-ray source is sent through a sample and is scattered by the biomolecules in that uh, sample. Um, with uh, the intensity of the scattered uh, radiation being uh, detected on, on the detector here as a function of the magnitude or the modulus of the scattering vector um, given by the uh, uh, mathematical re relationship shown uh, to the right here. Um, and so what I've tried to illustrate with the top figure here is that um, the pattern on a detector can readily be uh, transformed into um, the, the well-known um, plot shown on the top right here in the slide where we have depicted the intensity of the, um, um, of the scattered radiation as a function of the modulus of the scattering vector. Um, in the lower panel here, um, I outline a SACS calculation. Um, so SACS can be, um, can be calculated as a sum of um, elementary scatterers that can be atoms. Uh, using the Debye formula. And the Debye formula is not a new formula. It's uh, from 1915. Um, but a very efficient computation of this um, uh, intensity in this way is a, a relatively new uh, phenomenon. Uh, so the Debye formula is essentially a double sum over all atom pairs um, of the products of the uh, atomic scattering or form factors um, for the elementary scatterers um, multiplied with this sampling function, which is sine to um, Q times the distance between uh, the atoms. And um, so, so using this, applying this uh, formula um, can now be done quite efficiently uh, on, on even very large uh, structures and will then yield this um, calculated scattering profile um, shown to the right in the lower right corner. And um, we can, it, it's readily seen here that these profiles can be easily compared to each other. Um, the profiles in play here are actually for um, the human insulin hexamer. So why molecular modeling for SACS analysis? Well, so it is, um, as I mentioned, an, an atomistic alternative um, to uh, the coarse-grained models that are sometimes used in SACS. Um, so here SACS can be used as a, a constraint for building a molecular model. Um, and SACS can readily be predicted from the atomic coordinates, as, as I indicated with the Debye formula. Um, the Debye the formula is um, used in programs such as Chrysol or Fox and uh, many other programs that uh, then allow a very high throughput evaluation of proposed molecular models. And these proposed molecular models, they can be uh, snapshots from, for instance, MD simulations uh, or molecular models um, generated in, in other ways. So the first example I would like to discuss here is about peptide oligonucleotide conjugates. Um, and uh, in this study that was first authored by Harvey from the uh, University of Southern Denmark, um, we sought to um, uh, study this, the self-assembly of de novo des uh, designed uh, biomolecules. And the idea was to combine two orthogonal drivers of self-assembly into one um, construct. Um, that was the coil coil formation of peptides and the triple helix formation of oligonucleotides. Uh, so here in the middle panel, um, 
I've outlined the underlying ideas and uh, the sequences involved. Um, the peptide sequence is a well-known uh, sequence um, from the literature and, and from the uh, crystallographic databases. It, um, it's called coil VLD, um, and it forms a, a triple coiled coil structure. Um, in our study here, we have uh, attached a N-terminal tyrosine as a spectroscopic uh, probe. Um, the oligonucleotide sequences in play are listed below the peptide, um, and they um, were uh, selected to form a triplex, a oligonucleotide triplex. Um, in the first of the sequences, ON1, um, uh, some nucleotides have been uh, underlined uh, to indicate a locked nucleic acid, and um, some have been uh, written in small letters to in indicate a um, methylated uh, deoxycytidine. Um, and here, to the right of the uh, peptide uh, of the sequence scheme, uh, there are cartoon representations of the peptide and the oligonucleotides. Um, they are then, uh, the peptide was then uh, acido uh, functionalized and uh, the oligonucleotides uh, were functional, functionalized with the bicyclononine. And um, this is an example of click chemistry. So they were clicked together. Um, and the idea was then that uh, these uh, three uh, peptide oligonucleotides Type conjugates would hybridize to form um, this hetero uh, trimer shown to the far right here in the middle panel, uh, which is uh, referred to as POC1 plus, plus POC2 plus POC3. And below that structure, uh, uh, I show the, the structure of uh, the linkage involved here, um, linking the two domains, the peptide and the oligonucleotide domains. So it was uh, found from uh, gel experiments and um, SACs that uh, there were different molecular weights um, for, for this system at uh, different concentrations. So at a low concentration of 7.2 micromolar, um, the indicated molecular weight corresponds to uh, the heterotrimer, POC1, POC2, POC3, um, as expected. But at the high concentration, um, the molecular weight corresponds to a dimer of the heterotrimer, so some kind of dimeric system. <clears throat> so in order to model this, um, I will just outline um, how I, um, in that study, constructed a molecular model uh, just to show the tools involved. Um, so uh, in order to, to build a model of the POC1, POC2, POC3 with, uh, with reasonable symmetry, um, I, um, I started out by, by building the uh, oligonucleotide tri triplex using standard nucleotides. And I did that in this uh, Accelerus Discovery Studio. Um, so I outlined here in, in color coding the different programs used in this process just, just to show um, how it's done. And so this, um, this triplex um, was then modified by inserting special nucleotides and locked nucleotides and um, uh, the, lock, the locked uh, nu nucleic acids and, um, uh, and the different modified uh, nucleic acids to, to give the structure corresponding to the oligonucleotide sequences. That wasn't done in Maestro. Um, and some local geometry optimization was also done on these uh, modified uh, nucleotides. Um, then I proceeded to build the linkers also in Maestro um, and used some confirmational uh, search to, um, to, to produce realistic confirmations of the linkers from which I selected extended linker confirmations. Um, and in the next step, I um, built the peptide, which was a pretty easy task because it's available in the uh, Cambridge crystallograph uh, crystallographic database. Um, and, um, yeah, well, sorry, is of course in the, in the protein data bank. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and uh, here the modification was just adding the N-terminal tyrosine and adding hydrogens and some structural adjustment of the uh, N-terminal amines uh, so as to um, be in position for attaching the linker. Um, and so over here, I uh, to, to the right, I illustrate uh, that uh, these three um, structural segments were then merged in an iterative process by superposition and structural relaxation, yielding the, um, um, the extended uh, molecular model shown to the far right here. So to improve on, on this structure, um, we uh, did MD simulations. So we solvated the structure in a, in a cubic water box with uh, 16 angstroms of water on each side of the macromolecule uh, to ensure a, a proper buffer and avoid uh, certain simulation artifacts. We added uh, counter ions, sodium counter ions, uh, to neutralize the uh, oligonucleotide uh, charge um, and also added uh, an extra ionic uh, background emulating a physiological environment. Uh, so this yielded a system of uh, roughly half a million atoms. Um, so um, we did a, a relatively short MD simulation that actually turned out to be uh, sufficient for this purpose. 15 nanoseconds MD simulation in, uh, in Desmond, um, TPU accelerated uh, MD code. Uh, in the NPT ensemble at 300 Kelvin using uh, this OPLS 2005 force field, uh, which was um, freely available at the time of the simulation here. And uh, the coordinates were then saved from the simulation every 20 picoseconds, yielding 750 confirmations. Um, so the OPLS 2005 force field suffers from not actually having uh, good oligo oligonucleotide parameters. Um, so in, in this particular study here, we restrained the positions of the oligonucleotide uh, during MD and just uh, let uh, the peptide and the lingers move. Um, and uh, so after the simulation, um, we predicted SACs from each of the 750 MD frames and selected the best frame based on the fit to the experimental SACs. And this was done with the uh, FOX. Um, so here I show the, um, basically I show a graph of all the uh, predictions from all the 750 MD frames, uh, the goodness of fit against the experimental uh, SACS data at low concentration, because that's where we expect we just have a hetero primer. And I show some selected uh, molecular structures along this um, trajectory. And um, it can be seen that uh, at, at the start, we have this uh, highly linear structure that I initially modeled. And with time, a kink is introduced into the structure uh, in the region uh, connecting the, the peptide with the oligonucleotide. And the kink seems to be more, uh, get more pronounced with time. Uh, and then actually it, uh, this, this bend then becomes a little uh, bit uh, uh, linearized again, but it, uh, the point is the structure fluctuates around a, a bend conformation. And it can be seen that the best fit to SACS was actually for the, uh, for, the most, uh, for the most pronounced kink in the structure here. And so I've shown that structure to the right and right panel uh, here um, and the fit against SACS here. Um, so at 7.2 micromolar, we got a, a fairly good fit to SACS with the, with this, uh, with this structure here. Um, so what about the high concentration SACS data that, that indicated a dimer of heterotimers? Um, in order to investigate that scenario, um, I took the previously shown structure, um, and, um, and simply docked it against itself in, in all possible uh, combinations uh, using a program called patch dock made by the same people who make Fox. Um, and this gives a, a very large ensemble of uh, all kinds of dimers. Some of them are not um, chemically relevant or physically realistic, but um, the idea was then to simply predict SACs from, from this large ensemble and select the best model um, from the dimer ensemble best, uh, based on FOX predictions. 
Um, and of course, one could ask why not just do an MD simulation of uh, two heterotrimers instead of this docking? And uh, the answer to that is that would be an extremely computationally intensive, at least at the time of the um, preparations for, for this article here. And, and also we had the problem of not having proper oligonucleotide parameters in the force field at that time, as I also mentioned. Um, so shown to the right is this, um, this fit of the, um, the, the best model that uh, fit the um, uh, high concentration data here. And uh, it's uh, actually a, a fairly good fit. Um, so here I show the, uh, the high concentration and the low concentration data and their respective fits to molecular models together. And also from this study, um, we did um, uh, we did transmission electron uh, uh, microscopy, or rather Rasmus Thompson did that. Um, in the in the uh, young Chen's group, um, and it was actually observed that uh, even on the surface here, uh, or even in a yeah, sorry, it's not actually a surface, but even in a non-solvent uh, uh, state, um, the um, uh, there's a pronounced kink in the in the observed structures here, uh, at least for some of these temp class averages. Um, so uh, that uh, served as a, a confirmation um, of, of the existence of this kink in the structure. So um, another project I would like to um, discuss here is then uh, DNA hairpin stabilized silver nanoclusters. Um, it is known uh, for some time now that, that oligonucleotides can stabilize silver nanoclusters uh, yielding highly emissive complexes that are both relatively non-toxic and photostable. They can then be used as uh, fluorophores in uh, biology, for instance, for protein and DNA detection or cell staining. Um, but there's uncertainty about the uh, geometry of the silver nanocluster. Uh, is it a nanowire, is it a rod or something else? Um, so, um, so in, in this work here, um, uh, first authored by, uh, by Rika, um, we, um, uh, Rika did high yield uh, synthesis of um, DNA silver nanoclusters with a cytosine loop hairpin, uh, an example of the structure uh, is shown here. Um, and as can be seen from that structure, there's a overhang here in this particular case that can partially fold back on itself. Um, and these structures were purified by size exclusion chromatography and characterized by um, various forms of spectroscopy um, and page and uh, um, ICPMS, as well as with uh, SACS. So um, the goal of combining SACS and molecular modeling in this study was then again to obtain a low resolution solution structure um, of these DNA uh, silver nanoclusters. And uh, there were some assumptions uh, also um, partially based on, on, on previous work um, that the systems uh, dimerize and um, assemble uh, head to head uh, bridged by uh, a silver nanocluster. So uh, something like uh, something along the lines of, of what I've tried to, to show here. Um, so there were some, some further assumptions in the modeling. Um, there were 12 silver atoms per DNA dimer that was uh, found by ICPMS. Um, and uh, also, it was assumed that each hairpin uh, DNA duplex uh, interacts with, uh, by um, the N N3 position of, um, of uh, C13, C14, and C15, uh, shown here on, on figure, with the edge of a, a planar um, silver nanocluster uh, with a charge of plus six. Um, another thing was that the two DNA duplexes are uh, were assumed to be anti-parallel, and that uh, will make a bit more sense when I show some three D uh, structures in, in a moment. Um, so um, the AG uh, 
nanocluster geometry um, was also assumed to resemble a planar accordion-like model proposed by Cobb et al. Um, and everyone can see that um, this model here uh, strongly resembles the accordion on the left. Um, so that was this model um, proposed by, by Cobb in uh, 2014. Um, and uh, so the model consists of a metallic uh, core of silver, where each silver atom is attached to uh, silver iron, which is then uh, bonded to, um, to cytosine. And uh, the parameters I, I give in this figure here are from the uh, COP uh, study. So um, unfortunately, uh, direct um, geometry optimization uh, of, of this structure uh, failed uh, with the with DFT in, in, in various quantum code, codes I, I tried to use. Um, so another approach was required. Um, and um, so instead of uh, trying to optimize the entire cluster, um, I built a small model for interaction between uh, three cytosines um, and, and three uh, silver ions of uh, silver nanocluster H. Uh, the model is, is shown here as model A. Um, and that model could be DFT optimized with using implicit solvation and um, with the constraint that the silver ions were restrained to move along a line represent, representing the edge of a planar silver nanocluster. Um, so with the convergence success for this model, I could then move on to uh, build a larger model where I merged two of model, this model A with an idealized accordion model core um, so I attached two copies of model A on the edges of this uh, idealized accordion-like structure and did a loose DFT optimization um, at the B3 lip, uh, D3 level of theory. And again, that actually uh, converged with, at least with loose um, optimization criteria. Um, so this call could now be, um, this core structure could now be merged with hairpin structures um, for, for the DNA that were modeled in a, in a similar fashion um, to what I've shown before. So again, the, this, this DNA hairpin itself was then built with Accelerus Studio and merged on this um, nanocluster here, uh, this uh, DFT optimized nanocluster. Um, so the model to the right is then the final uh, symmetrized um, model uh, for, for this dimeric system. And so here I just show um, the sex data versus the predictions from, from these models. There's the prediction from the monomer, just the, the hairpin uh, itself and its sex data and uh, the predictions from the dimer and uh, its sex data here. Um, so we actually achieved a, a fairly good uh, fit for both cases here. Um, and here again to the left is the, um, uh, the, the final model um, for, for, the, for the dimer. Um, and to the right is a, a U-shaped uh, or um, a, a parallel um, configuration of this system. And we can see that there's some deviation that I've tried to indicate with the red arrows here from the uh, experimental Sachs curves. So um, it is plausible that both species are, are present in some proportion and uh, uh, to each other in, 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 uh, in solution. But uh, in this study, we then proposed that the, um, that the anti-parallel uh, dimer is, is um, most probably dominating. Um, the final project I'll discuss is terpyridin insulin. Um, Knud already spoke in his chem talk about terpyrid and insulin um, and um, did a very good description of uh, fractal geometries. Um, so I'll not talk that much about that aspect here, but uh, just to recapitulate, uh, nearly half a billion people uh, live with, uh, estimated to live, live with diabetes, uh, of which 10% are uh, type one di diabetics. 
Um, so this urges the need for new instruments with uh, tunable pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Um, and uh, it, uh, in mesyl ion juice self-assembly of proteins could be exactly the way to create new and, and dynamic uh, bio nanomaterials, including therapeutic ones. And uh, here we focus on luminescent lanthanide coordination, such as europium. Um, that that could uh, it's it's known that this type of coordination can be useful in biological probes. So it was an interesting idea to work with europium in the context of uh, insulin. So again, uh, this study here, first authored by uh, Narendra, um, introduces then the terpene in human insulin. The terpene in is in introduced at the B29 position here. Um, and uh, when exposed to europium, we had some very interesting uh, SACS data. So um, with uh, increasing europium concentration, the, the SACS scattering uh, increased very significantly. Um, shown in the, in the red curve here to the right is the uh, terpene human insulin without europium, which resembles the SACS curve for human insulin, not shown here, but you have to take my word for that. Um, and to the right, uh, I show the pair distance distributions um, corresponding to the SACS scattering data. Um, and I have annotated these pair distance distributions with estimated molecular uh, weights from um, during a guinea fit and extrapolating uh, the guinea fit to the um, to the scattering uh, at, uh, to the I zero, um, and we can see that the molecular weights are uh, pretty significant here for these assemblies. So, can molecular modeling help to elucidate this situation? Um, well, um, so in the study, uh, photoluminescence suggests that the core structure is uh, uh, really a, a dimer of terpene uh, human insulin um, coordinating europium and there's also the presence of uh, two water molecules coordinated. Um, so it's something like the structure I've shown in the middle here. Um, and from that structure, I could build a 3D model using known crystal structures for insulin and, and terpene and europium complexes, uh, yielding a model shown at the bottom here. Um, and uh, that model then needed to uh, be refined in order to be used. And I would have liked to include a movie of an empty simulation here in the middle. Um, unfortunately, that caused the presentation to crash. So here it shows stability over dynamics. But I show you the endpoint to the right here. That's the equilibrated um, terpene um, europium um, uh, complex. Um, and that's then the suggested building block for larger oligomers. Um, so to proceed here, we need to think about how we can calculate scattering from a mixture of oligomers. And in general, the, the formula is like uh, this. Um, the intensity can be written as uh, a sum of uh, products of this type here where the uh, weight fraction of uh, a scattering species is given by the X and the scattering from the subunit comprising a species uh, I is this P here. And finally, does, uh, it is multiplied with a function describing the effect uh, on scattering of organizing the subunit into an oligomer. Um, and there's mass conservation here. So the individual contributions from scatterers, um, the, uh, the, the weight fractions, of course, have to, to sum to, to one for all the oligomers in the solution. A special case of this is then a mixture of dimers and factors of dimers. I tried to write that out here. Um, so here we have basically two terms um, in, the, um, in, in play. And the first term um, is just the uh, scattering uh, for a dimer uh, molecular model, such as the one I uh, showed you the uh, MD equilibration of. Um, so just the calculated scattering for that model uh, times its, um, uh, it, its, its fraction, uh, its, mo its molecular um, fraction here, and um, plus the, um, the, the proportion of 
this um, dimer in the form of fractals. And uh, times this function here, which uh, is an expression of how um, the uh, individual scattering curves are combined to um, give the, the scattering of a fractal structure. Um, so this, this function over here is really a combination of the so-called uh, Texera model um, developed by Texera for predicting small angle scattering uh, from fractal systems. Um, and the main parameters are listed here. Um, so we can identify the radius of the molecular model um, and the fractal dimension and, and a characteristic size of individual fractal domains here. Um, so this is a, there are quite a few parameters, parameters here to be, uh, to be fitted against SACS data. Um, and uh, I would like to thank Lisa Alet for teaching me how to do that uh, um, using uh, a Fortran program um, for this purpose. Um, so the results um, uh, for, for actually doing this fitting to SACS data is shown here for um, uh, the low concentration European preparation of terpurin, human insulin, and the high concentration. Um, and uh, what we can see here is that um, the fractal dimension is higher. Uh, it's 2.66 for the high concentration europium, somewhat lower for the lower concentration europium. Um, the proportion of uh, dimers in fractal form is also higher uh, uh, at the higher uh, European concentration compared to the lower. Um, but this uh, uh, correlation length here is then smaller or the, the um, fractal domain size is smaller for the higher concentration uh, European preparation. And I've tried to uh, uh, illustrate the um, uh, just a, a toy model of a uh, uh, of a random fractal with the um, with the fractal dimension of 2.66 and one with uh, 2.3 uh, here. So these are just these bead models I've shown here are just toy models really, uh, but they illustrate the fractal dimension dimensionality. Um, and to the right here, I've tried to illustrate how uh, one could think of each of these beads then corresponding to the molecular model that I arrived at um, in the MD simulations. Um, so, um, so we have a description now uh, of a uh, scattering from a fractal system um, where the building block uh, is a well-defined molecular model that we have arrived at. But of course, the end result is not a very large molecular model for a complete fractal, but it is kind of a combination of a molecular model and uh, and. Uh, and this fractal model. So the question is, could we then hy hypothesize about how um, a molecular structure would look um, in, in, in fractal form? And here again, we can, we can look at the molecular uh, model from the MD simulation, and we can identify that the actually here to the left, that the native dimerization interface is still exposed in this model. So we could have, we could imagine at least that um, uh, even when uh, terpyrid and insulin is bound to, to europium, we can still have native uh, dimerization style oligomerization going on here. And um, to the right here, I try to highlight the free carboxylates also present in the molecular model. And it is also conceivable at least that the free carboxylates can bind europium um, and giving rise to a, a large network uh, such as the one shown to the far right here. Um, and perhaps these two um, interaction uh, modes actually um, uh, play together uh, to uh, um, are, are present at the same time to, to give a fractal network such as uh, uh, the one shown here, uh, where we both have um, uh, free carboxylates in, um, in play and uh, native dem demorization and uh, terpy europium interactions. Okay, um, now for something completely different. Um, my, my current um, project is actually not about SACS, but it's about 40 printing with proteins. And uh, that's what I, I got my um, 
uh, Willem experiment grant for doing. Uh, so uh, the just the idea of that is to uh, to use three um, D printing to to print protein systems with the fourth dimension embedded, which is um, some time dependency in the form of reactivity, movement, shape, memory. Um, or maybe fluidics. Uh, so I really want to develop protein inks with structural and functional properties. Uh, plant proteins are very attractive in this context because they're green, they're biodegradable and biocompatible. Uh, maize protein, especially the alpha zane, is, is uh, also particularly interesting. It's a hydrophobic protein. It is thermoplastic, so you can melt it um, at a temperature that is uh, similar to uh, typical filaments from hobby 3D printing. And I illustrated a hobby type 3D fused deposition modeling 3D printer here in the middle, where a filament is basically driven through a heated nozzle and deposited in a very fine, uh, fine grained manner on the build platform here. Um, so these alpha zines are in, uh, soluble in alcohol water mixtures and the sequences are known, but there are no known uh, 3D structure. Um, so that could also be a computational aspect here, and I would try to insert an alpha fold model rotating to the far right here. Uh, there could be a computational aspect in this project trying to, to find out uh, where could, could this uh, structure be modified, for instance, with chemical uh, handles of various kinds. Um, and so this is just to illustrate um, how, I, uh, how, how I tried to make a filament for use with a hobby 3D printer here. Um, I have this um, I purchased this uh, extrusion, this filament extrusion uh, device, and constructed uh, constructed that from. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's bought as as a set you have to assemble basically. Um, so it basically consists of a large uh, screw going through the middle here, and you can add polymer powder into this funnel here, um, and the material is transported along this barrel where it's heated in one end, and filament comes out with a diameter of uh, 1.75 millimeters, which is the typical size used for filaments and fused deposition modeling. Um, so I tried this, this with the polycaprolactone, which is uh, an, an interesting polymer that melts at about 65 Celsius, and it worked very beautifully. And I also tried it with the same uh, preparation with glycerol added as a plasticizer. Um, and that unfortunately didn't work that well. Um, I, I tried to run this process at 130 Celsius. And as you can see um, here in the lower panel in the middle, the filament has a sort of dusty surface and is actually as shown here on the right in these photos is very brittle and not fully plasticized. So there's definitely some optimization to do here. Um, and I've also, <clears throat> purchased a commercial bioprinter that can print using three interchangeable printheads, a syringe pump, a thermoplastic printhead, and a pneumatic pr printhead. Um, and also one can use different uh, uh, types of light for cross-linking. It has a very fine uh, resolution of one micrometer and a clean chamber and UV sterilization options. And this printer would then be useful for working with the very um, high precision work with the different protein preparations such as molten uh, protein or hydrogels or even cross-linkable cross um, hydrogels that could then be cross-linked cross using, uh, 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 yeah, using the light as some of these wavelengths here. Um, so I just want to finish here by acknowledging uh, my, all my co-authors on these um, Different projects here: yeah, the peptide oligonucleotide conjugates um, with the first with Harvey uh, from SDU being the first author, um, and a lot of contributions from from uh, from other people here. Uh, the silver nanocluster um, project with the Rika as the first author. Um, Terpy human insulin with Narendra as, as the first author, and I've tried to list the affiliations here with the color code so what, that one could get an overview of sort of the distribution of where um, the, the different uh, collaborators are. Um, so, and uh, I would also like to thank everyone in the KGJ group. Um, and uh, finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge funding from uh, the Novo Nordisk uh, Foundation for um, the Turkey uh, insulin and the also uh, partially the silver uh, nanocluster. Uh, stories and the Willem Foundation for the peptide oligonucleotide um, project. 
um, and for my current uh, for funding my my current salary in the 40 uh, protein printing. Um, and finally, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention.